Today's topic is Jesus Loves You, uh, Get to Know Him. And the reason this is so important is because uh, Jesus says at the end of time, everybody's going to recognize him. But it's far, far better if you already have a relationship with him, that you already have discovered how much he loves you, that you already have uh, used some of the gift of life that you have to invest in his kingdom. So we're going to talk about that today. And uh, we're going to start out with reminding ourselves of what Jesus said about the end. So uh, last week we looked at some verses and we're going to rush through them, but just as a way to remind us to kind of set the stage in Matthew 24, if you want to follow along. Jesus says, in the end days, they're going to hand you over to be tortured. So there are times when the Christian church has been tortured, uh, and this is going to be one of those times. They're going to hand you over to be tortured, and you will be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. So today it's not such a bad thing to be a Christian. In the last days it's going to be a, socially a very bad thing. You will, it will cost you to be known as a Christian. Then many will fall away, Jesus said, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So not only do you have the hardness of being identified as a Christian in those days, but you've got people who will have tempting messages who will cause you to think, well, I wonder if that's really true. And so you'll have to be keenly aware and watchful and careful. Uh, because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. So this is not a good sign when uh, one of the things that buoys society up is the love of, of you, the Christian love that permeates the nation. And when love grows cold, things are going to be far, far harder than they are now. Uh, the news is going to be much more bleak if you tr decide to turn it on to watch it on television. The one who endures to the end, Jesus says, will be saved. So that's the context we looked at last week. Jesus says the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world in this time and then as a testimony to the nations and then the end will come. So that's the setup for this time that we're looking at and we'll take a further look at that today. We're going to start in Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet um, hundreds of years before Jesus talking about the end of time. So Zechariah is looking from his vantage far into the future, uh, past Jesus come, being born to the time of Jesus' return. Zechariah says uh, that God says, I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication. So at the end of time, one of the things that you're going to see besides all the disasters that Jesus was announcing is that people in Israel, this is prophecy is to people in Israel, people in Israel are going to be gripped with compassion and supplication, crying out to God because uh, they're looking on the one who's pierced. They're going to see Jesus and recognize him for who he is, not just a prophet, but the Son of God, the Messiah, their Messiah. They're going to look on the one whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So Zechariah says there's a time coming when people are going to be in tears because they see the sacrifice of Jesus and what he did for them. Um, many of us hear maybe on a weekly basis or maybe a daily basis, the story of Jesus Christ crucified and are not moved to tears. Uh, but the, Zacharias says, uh, time's coming for Israel when Israel is going to recognize to the core what Jesus has done for them and for the world. And it will cause them to be weeping because they see clearly what he's done. Joel is another prophet, uh, and if you're looking at these verses in the Bible, if you're following along, Joel is in the same group of 
books as uh, Zacharias, so I uh, just need to um, page a few pages back to get to Joel. Joel 2.28, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's remarkable. So in the, at the beginning of the book, God poured out God's spirit on one or two people a century as far as the record is concerned. Maybe more than that, but the people that we know of, it was rare. King David, Saul, King Saul, Moses, but, but not lots of people. It was just a few people. And, and in Moses' day, at one point Moses had a monopoly, and then God took some of that spirit and anointed a lot of leaders so that they could have the same spirit. But it was not generally distributed. When Jesus arrived, Jesus said, I'm going to leave, and that's better than my staying. Because when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And what at one time was only available to King David, Moses, and a few leaders is going to be generally available to anyone who asks. The whole Christian church has access to the Holy Spirit. Anytime you want, you can ask for more of God's Spirit in you. In Joel, Joel's prophesying of a time beyond that. So we went from just one or two people that we might know out of all of our friends and family who would have God's Spirit in a great measure, to any Christian can have God's Spirit in great measure, to a time when all flesh, everybody, going to have access to God's Spirit. God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Well, you can maybe identify what category you're in by looking at that. Uh, even on male and female slaves in those days, so in other words, people that society does not value are going to be part of this. God's not going to leave anyone out because of their social status or their class or how much uh, they're valued. Even on male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. So there's going to be signs that you can see uh, that will indicate that the time is near. There's a fire uh, quite a while back that um, was 15 miles away. Some of our members had their homes endangered. But it had burned so much of the forest 15 miles away and more that here in La Jolla, at noon, it looked like the sun had set. And so when I drove into church, uh, Every shopkeeper I passed was not in the store, but was outside looking at the sky. It was something no, none of us had seen. It was amazing. And it will be like that at the end. There will be unmistakable signs that something has happened. In the, we've got a swimming pool where I live, a big Olympic-sized swimming pool, and I stuck my hand in it. I drew it out and it looked like I was wearing a glove. The ash was so fine that it completely covered my hand in little tiny microparticles. So there's going to be signs that people can recognize. Something is different. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. So every now and then there's enough pollution in the air, a volcano has gone off, or farmers have burned their field, or there's been a forest fire, something, so that you can see what this will look like. Because, can I see, how many of you have seen a blood red moon? Yeah, it's kind of, over a lifetime it's a fairly common event. At the end of time, it will happen so much uh, that, uh, that people will cry out with fear, the Bible says. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, there's going to be these signs. Then, Joel says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, awesome promise 
for when things are looking so bad, you'll be able to still cry out and have God rescue you. In Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Better to not wait to the end. So if you know anything about the principle of uh, compounding interest, you know that on the last day before retirement, you can decide to set up a savings plan. But the amount available to you is probably not going to be enough to get you very far. What matters is if you earlier started putting money in so it could accrue interest and especially so the interest could compound. So if you start putting money in 10 years before retirement, there's not much accruing that will take place. Way better than starting the day, befo day before retirement, uh, but pretty much it's going to be just the money you put in is the money you draw out. If, however, you had taken that same amount of money in that same amount of time, 10 years, but just done it when you were 20, the difference is extraordinary. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the theory of money, but just to say that part of the reason this works is because inflation keeps ratcheting up the value of money. So if you've got somebody you're talking to who's amazing you by how much money you're going to have in retirement and you're in your 20s or 30s, you need to figure out how much that's going to be worth when you're in your retirement age. But talk to me afterwards if you don't know that. Among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. You can, on the last day, say, Jesus, I want to follow you and be accepted into heaven on the strength of that. That's like putting all your money into retirement on the last day. It works. It's not as good as in your 20s or earlier in your life, saying, Jesus, in my youth, I'm giving these years to you. And staying with that throughout all your days. It's not too late. Wherever you are, it's never, it's always better to start now than to start next week. Revelation. We're going to look at the same picture, but from... Uh, uh, maybe A.D. 100 or 70 to 100. So this is after Jesus has been crucified and after most of the disciples have been martyred. John is in his old age and of all the disciples, he's not been martyred. He's in exile on an island and he has a vision of what the end of time will be like. First he has a vision of what Jesus wants to say to the churches and then a vision of what things will like at, be at the end. Here's what he says in Revelation 1. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you from him who was, from him who is and who was and who is to come. So God is in all phases of time. And from the seven spirits who are before God's throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is ruler of the kings of the earth. Look, he's coming with the clouds. So John announces what Jesus has announced. We'll get to that in just a second. Jesus is intending to come back in the clouds. So there will be a day when it's visible. You won't have to be watching CNN or Fox or one of the state real stations or uh, Comedy Central, whoever's replaced Jon Stewart or however you're getting your news. Um, it will be apparent to everyone. He's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. All the shopkeepers lined up looking, not looking at their shops anymore, looking up to the sky to see what's going on. Even those who've pierced him, those of us, all of us, 
who by our lives have done things for which Jesus died, all of us will see him as he is, with love in his eyes and wounds in his body because of his love for us. Every eye will see him, and on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So earlier we looked at a passage, Jerusalem's going to be cut with compassion, and they're going to be crying. All the tribes, same thing. Every nation, every people group, everyone will cry. Because they will see Jesus and his compassion and what he did, and they will remember what they did with their lives. So it is to be. Amen. One last verse we'll look at. So this is Matthew 24. So uh, Jesus is going to be, we looked right at the start of this message at what we looked at last week. The verse we're going to look at now continues from the time Jesus described, where people were thrown into prison, they were killed. There are signs in, that Joel talked about. Jesus reminded us of those signs. Then he continues, immediately after the suffering of those days, so in the last days when things are so hard, immediately after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. I don't know if this means that it'll look like the stars fell out of heaven because it's so, the sky's so black, which would be in keeping with the sun not appearing and the moon not appearing, or if it's going to be that there's going to be a meteorite shower of some kind. But the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So what John said in Revelation, Jesus said before uh, John watched it in his vision. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The ultimate of Jesus' return is that it begins a party that is scheduled to last through all time. But the party begins with some sadness as people see Jesus and have clarity about what he's done for them and what they did in return. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. So in light of where we're headed, I have 10 suggestions and this is where we're closing. Uh, you may have heard of the 10 commandments. These are the 10 suggestions. So, and they're from me, not from Moses. Uh, but I think they might be valuable. And uh, what I encourage you to do is to think, uh, some, not all of these will apply to you. Some you will already have done. Some you won't care to do. Won't seem like it's that interesting at the moment. But find one or two out of these suggestions that seem like, hey, I'd like to work on that. So ask Jesus to be your Lord. If you haven't already asked Jesus to be your Lord, now would be a great time to do that. Uh, second suggestion, follow Jesus. So what that means is do what he tells you to do. Many people know all about Jesus. The, f the people who crucified Jesus knew all about God's word. They just crucified Jesus. Satan knows all about Jesus, all about God, just doesn't want to follow him. So giving, after giving your life to Jesus, it's important that you do what he says. Follow Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. So uh, Jesus says you can do this at any time. Continually receive infilling from the Holy Spirit. Very helpful. Especially as things get harder. One of the things that you'll know that things are getting harder and that you'll know that you're close to a breakthrough is the level of discouragement around you will increase. You will have internal voices and external voices telling you, you should really give up now. When that happens, it's a great sign. When it seems like it's getting harder and harder to slog through, start rejoicing because you are close to a breakthrough. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then the suggestion that some of you may not think of on your own, speak in tongues. 
And the reason that I recommend this today while we're thinking about the end times is because the Bible says that what speaking in tongues does is it builds you up. And there's a certain level of fitness that you need to make it through a regular day. Anyone, most everyone, can make it through a regular day without too much trouble. But when the car backs over your grandchild, you need to pick up that car. And in those days, you'll find out, do you have strength for the extraordinary times or not? The Bible says that speaking in tongues helps build you up, which I would think, if we're heading into days like this that get hard, it would be very helpful to have been built up along the way. So that's a suggestion for you to think about. Read the Bible daily. This is not a magic pill. The Pharisees who crucified Jesus knew the Bible inside out. But better to know the Bible and to know what God's voice sounds like than to not know the Bible. Pray daily. Most of us, I think, probably pray on a regular basis, meaning, Oh, God, help! I'm not talking about those kind of prayers. Awesome when you do that. Good to know that God has your back. Good to know that God will help in any circumstance, big or there's nothing too big, nothing too small. Good to cry out when you're in trouble. But also good to remind yourself that daily you want to set aside time to praise and to worship and to give thanks and to hold God in the esteem that God deserves. Uh, another suggestion, get along with God regularly. Jesus regularly left his disciples and went on a walk. Up the mountain, early in the morning he left, various, just to get away. Loved hanging out with his disciples. Needed some alone time with God every now and then. This doesn't have to be every day. I don't know you know, for your life how often it has to be. I, you know, maybe once a month. It, it doesn't have to be a big deal either. Jesus just left some mornings early, came back the same morning and hung out with them the whole day. So, but get along with God regularly. Tithe and give generously. So, uh, I want to suggest you tithe because that makes my life so much easier. When you have the window of heaven open over you and God pouring out blessing, it's such a relief to me. You still call me from time to time saying, what do I do with all of this? But it's easier than, than someone who's at a, at a different state of their life. So uh, tithing isn't the end. People who are Christian uh, learn that God is a God of generosity and we give generously. And let me just say one more thing on this before we move on to the next. That doesn't mean you give visas money. Right? You don't give American, ex uh, yeah, American Express's money or MasterCard's money. If you don't have money, giving generously might be your time or your patience or your love or something else. But don't give something you don't have. If you don't have money, you don't give it. But most of us have an income from which we can choose to give generously. Uh, love God above all else. So this is suggestion number nine. Uh, obviously it's not number nine in order of priority. Jesus said this is the most important thing you can do with your life. And second most important is to love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus was coaching his disciples how to love their neighbors, the story that he used to illustrate it was one of compassion for someone who was broken, that nobody else cared for. Jesus used a story about a person who was completely beat up by robbers that everyone was trying to avoid and said, go and help someone like that. As Jesus sent out his disciples, some of you know that the way he taught people to love their neighbor was to announce the kingdom of heaven is near 
to heal the sick. All of you, 98% of you are doing that. Awesome. Uh, casting out demons, two-thirds of you are doing that. It's just awesome. Changing your neighborhood when you do that. Uh, raising the dead, 20% uh, uh, of you are looking at impossible situations that everybody says there's no hope there, we may as well not even try. 20% of you are saying, I could do some, or God can do something about that, and trying. And for those of you who are trying, uh, half said the situation's improved. For, a, for something that everybody else said, nothing will work. And cleansing lepers, awesome when you're doing that. Here's one way to get started. End of the message. There's a guy a year ago took 17 CEOs, entrepreneurs, to uh, Four Seasons in New York City and uh, had a dinner. The start of the dinner said, uh, it, and the next day was for coaching. So these are guys who are meeting each other and then they're going to be coached the next day. And uh, says, okay, here's how the three hour dinner is going to work. Two rules. Don't interrupt. Don't say something negative. Can you do it for three hours? Everybody said, oh yeah, of course. Certainly can. All right, so here's the rule, th rule three. If you can't, it's $20 every time you interrupt someone. $20 every time you say something discouraging or disparaging about what someone else has said. Can you, can you hold to that? Can you not say... These are guys who do a lot with their lives, who are able to accomplish a lot. Can you do that for three hours? Oh, yeah. Ten minutes, $400 on the table. A half an hour later, twice as much. One of the guys had to go out to an ATM. Sixteen of the seventeen put money on the table that night. The one guy who didn't, he got an index card. He wrote down, no interruptions, no judgments. He stuck it under his water glass and he just glanced at it every now and then to remind himself what he was doing. Something extraordinarily simple can help keep you on track if it's in your line of sight, reminding you what you want to do. So out of the ten suggestions, you may have decided, you know, today, the way I'm going to follow Jesus, I, I'm, I know that I have not cl cleansed any lepers in my life, that there are, are people that everybody else says should be avoided, and I really haven't been showing them the compassion that Jesus has for them. I'm going to start doing that. Whatever it is for you, uh, you can write on a card and just remind yourself, here's how I'm going to start spending the next three hours or the next day. We're going to take a moment for prayer. God, there are times when we don't need to be reminded. The, trumpet, the trumpets are blaring. You're in the sky. The sun's dark. The moon's blood red. It's really obvious what's going on. And there are times when we know what we want to do. We just slip. So if a technique like just filling out a note card and keeping it in eyesight so that we can remind ourselves how we want to behave today will help. Help us to do the things that will cause us to follow you. So that when you return, we are able with all the nations to weep 
at all what you have done for us but also to rejoice at hearing your words to us well done good and faithful one come inherit what I have been building since the beginning of time for you thank you for your mercy we praise you amen <clears throat>